Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond. It's been a little while since I posted a video, so I wanted to get back on the saddle. Uh, today I'm going to be looking at the Kenobi Room from TriHackMe. So I will hop over to my screen here so you can see the good stuff. And here I am, I'm joined in this room. I believe Kenobi is a subscriber-only room, but it says, walk through on exploiting a Linux machine, enumerate Samba for shares, manipulate a vulnerable version of ProFTB, and escalate your privileges with path variable manipulation. So let's go ahead and spin up this instance. I'll hit the deploy button. It says, make sure you're connected. So I will have to go do that uh, and try hack me and I will sudo open VPN, my VPN. I think I had a typo there. It's hard to see my keyboard when there's a microphone in my way. <laughs> I could use my headset, but I feel like I just look kind of stupid and dorky. Um, let's make a YouTube Kenobi folder and move in there. I'm gonna start a readme so I can keep track of everything that I particularly do, because I think that is good practice. I'll also go ahead and specify that this room will have the IP address. If I export an IP here, this guy. So I will go ahead and grab that and slap it in there. Now we'll go ahead and ping that IP address and it looks like he's up. Okay, so what do we need to do? Make sure you're connected to our network and deploy the machine. Yep, did that. Scan the machine with Nmap, how many ports are open? All right, so let's head back to our terminal and make a directory Nmap and I will Nmap tax C, SV. So save scripts or default scripts, uh, enumerate versions. I like to use tac on so I can save the Nmap directory. I will do this all on my IP address and I'll take a trick from optionals book. I'll use tac T5 and I think it's max retries yeah yeah yeah, 2500 so this should make it a little bit faster hopefully we'll see maybe it just ruins everything okay so now our nmap results are back uh let me explain that though that is uh t5 so the type or the kind of intensity is insane let's actually check out those arguments because i didn't do a good job of explaining really what those did oh template so Fine grain timing controls discussed in the previous section are powerful and effective. Some people find them confusing, so you can choose the appropriate values at these different levels. Um, insane is the crazy, crazy fast one. Was it discussed T5? Yeah. I would always recommend using T4. Some people love T5, though it's too aggressive for my taste. So it's just banging on doors, man. And max retries. Sets the maximum TCP scan delay to that many milliseconds. Let's check out what max retries is. Tac tac, max retries. Caps number of port scan probe retransmissions. Okay, so if it dies or if it can't get anything resulting back to it, it'll just kind of cap it out at that many retries. Anyway, we have our Nmap results. So let's go see what we've got here. We've got FTP open with seemingly an old version of Pro FTPD. Uh, SSH is open, 80. So it has a website. Oh, Little robots.txt there, admin HTML. We can go check that out. RPC bind on 111. NetBIOS, so Samba. Yep. 1097, that's interesting. 2049. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That seems odd to me. Maybe that came out because we use those funky options there. So let's rerun that script and I'll finagle with that when we're submitting our answers. How many ports are open? So we saw eight from our speed scan, but I believe the correct answer is seven because that other one I think came out of the blue. 1097. So that hopefully showcases both the syntax of using those speed scans in Nmap and how you might be kind of gambling as to what you might find. We saw that the port was filtered, so that was kind of cool. It kind of gave us a little inclination that maybe that's not right. Uh, it's not particularly open. And I guess that is what it's asking for. So seven ports are in fact open. I hadn't seen that before when I had scanned this previously. There we go. Nope, no more 1097. Okay, let's go on to task two. Uh, just for our notes, I'll do a task one. Let's do a no answer needed for him to how many ports are open. I just like to document and that probably takes away some time from the video, but I do wanna emphasize, hey, that's super duper important, take notes. And that way you'll have that ready for you in the future. 
All right, using Nmap, we can enumerate machine for SMB shares. Nmap has the ability to do this with a wide variety of networking tasks. There is a script to enumerate shares. So this is awesome because it's getting into a little bit of NSE or the Nmap scripting engine. Looks like we're going to specify that port 445 where we would typically see the information for SMB. Later versions of SMB after Windows 2000 began to use port 445 on top of a TCP stack. Using TCP allows that to work. All right. And we can use TACTAC script to specify an NSE script. And again, I think I've shown before, you could run locator, try and track down the file extensions that have a .NSE, files that have a .NSE file extension. And we need to specify our port here. So let's go ahead and do that. I will nmap this guy. I'll also save that output to nmap SMB scan. And since we saved our variable as an or our IP address as an environment variable, we can go ahead and run that. So this is going to be great because it's going to enumerate all of the SMB shares or the kind of file directories that are accessible to us on the network that it is publicly sharing. Uh, we could also try and enumerate users. Um, I like to typically use enum for Linux or that tool opt enum for Linux to do this as well. Uh, I store it in my opt directory. It's not actually called enum for Linux. But we could supply the host or the IP address, and that is in here. Looks like he actually has that AOK. -okay. So what did I just type? Enum for Linux. And the IP address. So that could spin off as well, and we could look for what it will track down for shares or users. So this got some results here. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. We have an account with guest. Looks like a hidden share. You can note it it's hidden or it's kind of intended to be hidden with the dollar sign at the end there. Has an anonymous share. We have access to read, write in it. And it looks like it puts us in home Kenobi share on the file system. So that's kind of interesting. Print is in there. That's pretty common. So you'll often see IPC and print. Those are normal or can be normal. Uh, anonymous looks peculiar. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. How many shares were found? We found three in total. Oh, we'll just grab that and save it in our notes. Wow, I took the entire paragraph. I hate highlighting with my mouse. One. We found a total of three. All right, what else do we have to do here? Most distributions of Linux carry SMB client. So let's use that to inspect one of the shares. So we can use the syntax SMB client and then whack whack or two forward slashes on the IP address and specifying the share with another forward slash and anonymous being the share that we want to access. Using your Camino will connect to the network's machine. Using your machine, it will connect to the machine's network share. Once you're connected, list the files in the share. What is the file you can see? Let's go check it out. How did Enum for Linux do? He's still going? Oh, he, he found the exact same shares. Anonymous, print, etc. Very, very cool. It looks like he's kind of brute forcing IDs and stuff like that. We don't need to worry about that. Let's go ahead and run SMB clients. Um, I do have that readily available to you. I don't know if it is installed. Uh, you might need to sudo apt install SMB client or some Samba tools or stuff like that. Let's go ahead and run that command though. SMB client with the IP address and I'll use the anonymous share. It's going to want to know my password because I didn't specify a username. So it's going to use mine and ask for mine by default. That doesn't matter because we're just going to kind of use anonymous access. So if I just whack enter, it will let me log in. I'm not specifying a password. The user doesn't particularly matter. We have anonymous access on this. So I'll type in ls to list some files out and we can see there is a log.txt file here on that share. Let's go ahead and supply that. I'll give that as our answer here for number two. Good, good. You can recursively download the SMB share too. Submit the username and password as nothing, just as we did. SMB get, that's kind of cool. I haven't actually used this tool before, so this is kind of some new learning for me, and that's what it's all about, right? Uh, SMB using kind of a schema here to preface our IP and the share. So let's go ahead and do that. I will actually break out of this guy and I'll make directory Samba so I can put those all in a specific place. And it's SMB get tack capital R. Uh, if you want to check out the other arguments and parameters you can pass to SMB get, again, you've got the man pages. W get like utility for downloading files over SMB. So that tack capital R is recursive and it'll download just about everything. Let's do it. Let's use SMB get tack capital R, SMB as our schema. IP address anonymous. And again, gonna ask for a password, just whack enter. It should be able to pull some stuff down. Might be a little bit, let's find out. Oh, he got it, he got log.txt. Okay, sweet. What is in that log.txt? Whoa, 
a lot of seemingly interesting stuff. Okay. Generating a public and private RSA key pair. Generating a file in, okay, created the directory home Kenobi SSH. Oh, so they're making an SSH key. Seemingly no password. Maybe we don't need their, we don't know if that's their input in there. So they've saved their private key and their public key. Oh, we also have pro FTBD. We did see that as a service. Okay, this looks like the config file for it. Default port. Oh, it's running as Kenobi, which is kind of interesting because maybe we could potentially reach that SSH key. Default root is commented out. So they're in a jailed thing. Normally want files to be available on overwrite. Anonymous puts us in there. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, the service is running as Kenobi. So we probably have access to what Kenobi can access. We also have SMB or our Samba share. A lot of information in that. There's a lot of comments here. This is kind of hard to scroll through. We could very well write to that directory though. It's worth a try. Yeah, read only doesn't seem to be particularly a concern. Anonymous, browsable, yes. Read only, yes. Guest okay, yes. Huh. Is it really read only? Oh, maybe for the person accessing the share, but not on the actual file system. It's just going to show that location. So if we were to use some other technique to move the SSH private key into the share, we could still access it as a user reading and reaching into the share. So maybe we'll have to use some other technique. Here they ask us, okay, what port is FTP running on? Well, we already found that from our Nmap scan. Let's go ahead and submit that. That's number two. Oh, sorry, that's number three here. What port is FTP on? Did I just copy that text? Yeah, I did. <laughs> 21. Just good to keep notes. And they're going to mount some information. Our earlier Nmap scan provided that 111 is running RPC bind. RPC is prepared, it tells RPC bind the address switch is listening and the RPC program number is prepared to serve. In this case, it can access a network file system. So we have some network shares. Now I typically see this on like port 2049, right? Because NFS, but I guess those are kind of paralleled and pulled together. Let's uh, hop out of this directory and go see what that has. What I do typically for this is because it's using show mount. Oh, um, is that the right IP address? I think so. Yeah, 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 whatever. I'll just change that. And it shows me that there is a var file or folder there. Uh, I would do that with show mount. So show mount tack E and then the IP address, which I need to go ahead and add in here. Show mount tack E, tack IP or dollar sign IP, and that will tell me the exact same information. So var is a folder we could go ahead and access and mount. So that's what they were asking for here. Let's go ahead and submit that. What mount can we see? Let's go slap that into our notes. I literally just copied and pasted this. Why am I typing it out? I've done this like out of habit for the last couple of videos and or like things that I've been doing for my own recording, just for me to go through some try hack me stuff. <laughs> It's just habit, hand jamming everything in because copying and pasting is so frustrating. Pro FTPD, okay, so now we're look, taking a look at that FTP server. Pro FTPD is a free and open source FTP server compatible with Windows and Windows, Linux and Windows. Whoa, it's been a while since I made a video. <laughs> it's also vulnerable in some past software versions. Okay, we get the version of our Pro FTPD. Let's use Netcat to go check that out. So you could do a simple banner grab with Netcat. Um, we could just connect cat to that IP address on port 21 and it'll tell me, Hey, that's the version. We also saw that in our results between our Nmap scan. So that's kind of pretty easy and handy to find out. Um, what, what is the version? 1.3.5. We can use Searchploit to find exploits for particular software versions. Searchploit is basically just a command line search tool for exploittb.com. It's pretty awesome. How many exploits are there for pro FTPD running? So if you haven't heard of Searchploit before, uh, I do want to showcase this because it's fantastic. Uh, if you go check out Offensive Security's ExploitDB GitHub, they do have, hey, 
like a GitHub local of, locally available copy of their entire exploit database that you'd normally navigate through online. They also offer a command line tool, Searchploit, that lets you go ahead and look through all of those entries in the database. So if you can grab just the software name or the software version number, you could pretty easily, okay, let's see what does the public already know about this? Is it vulnerable? Is there anything I can exploit? So there's some really cool stuff. Um, and let's, normally what I would do is I would get clone this. So in my op directory, because that's where I tend to store a lot of my tools, I have my exploit DB directory and search exploit is in there. So I would just create this as a prompt. I would modify my prompt to allow myself to just run search exploit from anywhere I'd like to be. So I was in try hack me YouTube Kenobi and I could just run search exploit, and there we go. Now I have all the arguments, but normally search exploit is pretty easy to use because you could just specify what it is that you're looking for as search terms, like literally just arguments following that, and it'll find stuff for you. So let's check this out. If I were to run search exploit on pro FTPD version 1.3.5, now we've got some results. So it looks like it's asking for how many we found, and we found three. Let's go check that out. La la la. Taking good notes. You probably hate me for it, <laughs> but I just want to showcase it. You should have found an exploit from ProFTPD's mod copy module. The mod copy module implements site CPFR and site CP2 commands, which can be used to copy files and directories from one place to another on the server. Any authenticated client can leverage these un unauthenticated clients. So we don't need to know any credentials. We don't need to know Kenobi's password. We don't need to know any other user's credentials to log into that FTP service. We can just do it via netcat, which is kind of cool. Copy files from any part of the file system to a chosen directory. So we know that the FTP service is running as the Kenobi user from the file on the share. We saw that, that log.txt file, and an SSH key was generated for that user. So we could potentially pull that SSH key into a location that we can read and access and then pull it in and then use it and then SSH as that user, Kenobi. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, if you want to take a look at some of these, I'll use Searchploit. Um, I'll actually just grab this text file because it will go ahead and explain it. You can use tag X with Searchploit to examine an entry given in the path there. So you can just copy and paste that in. And this will kind of talk about, hey, what syntax is really kind of being in place for this sort of attack um, and that he's going to use these site CPFR commands to say, this is the file that I want to copy. This is where I want to copy it to. And they're actually using a really cool technique here because they're using um, PHP, perhaps on the website. So they could potentially create some PHP code into port 80 or what's being served on the web page. And then because that page will be rendered with PHP, you could potentially get remote code execution and execute code and commands. Maybe we could do this too. I don't think I'm going to go into that in this video, but I, when I, when I used to teach and I taught the cyber threat emulation course, uh, this is something that I actually baked into the course was this exact exploit pro FTPD 1.3.5 showcasing the mod copy technique and showing that we could gain code execution. And the Metasploit module actually does that. So if you want to go check out the source code of the Metasploit module, like checking this out, this is pretty neat. You can see, here's a description that you would normally see within Metasploit. You could scroll through and see what arguments, parameters, and options they set. And it'll walk through the actual exploit in Ruby, which is very, very cool. Um, they use some interesting techniques because they use proc self command line, which will allow you to include the PHP payload to get the remote code execution. Um, I, I used this in the classroom because it was kind of cool in that there were only three exploits, but they showcased different ways of doing the same technique. The text file just explained it, showcased some syntax. The Metasploit module showcased it really, really well. But I was trying to say, hey, not all the time can we use Metasploit. We don't always want to do that. We kind of want to understand the exploit and see how we can weaponize it and write it ourselves. And we were doing that in the class typically within Python because Python's like my golden sword, right? I love that thing. So we would take a look at this Python code 
that someone has an exploit written in for, but it's kind of weird in that, okay, it's old Python 2. Um, it's kind of hard to read, really pretty difficult to look at, but you can see what they're doing for including commands. Um, they include it just as an argument and then that's a static command. You can't modify that or change that with like a get variable or a post variable. And the way that they use that proc cell file descriptor is kind of just a guess on what socket or what file descriptor is actually open for that. Um, so using the proc self command line as their copy from is a much better technique because it'll ensure that your PHP code is actually visible and can be copied for writing to the file server, writing to the web server, being able to see that PHP page and have it be executed as you access it. So anyway, sorry, tangent, uh, just some tinkering thoughts of, of teaching and showcasing this exploit and what you can do with it. Anyway, we know that it will allow us to copy one file to another location in the file system unauthenticated. And because the FTP server is running as the Kenobi user, we could access Kenobi's files, his SSH key, and potentially put it maybe in the Samba share so we could access it. So Try Hack Me includes a pretty nice picture just to showcase this, um, netcating to the IP address, using the site CPFR commands and site CP2. You should be able to see these kind of partial responses from the FTP server. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go do our netcat IP address port 21. So let's use our site CPFR, so copy from home kenobi.ssh idrsa because that's his private key and we know the location of this nfs share as well it's also in var temp or just slash var right that's what it's sharing for us and we could just create a directory in their temp and copy our idsa file over there so let's do that let's use site cp2 slash var, let's make a temp directory and IDRSA, and that successfully copied it. So if I were to go use SMB client one more time, where I went over to that IP address on the anonymous share, empty password, now we can go ahead and check out LS. Um, we seemingly do not have that temp directory. TD temp, nope. Is it just not there? Let's try that netcat syntax again. Site CPFR. Can I put it in just var IDRSA? Nope. Okay, so I need to have a direct read there. How do they do this? Oh, maybe it's just not showing it as we read it. We need to mount that temp directory to our machine. Or is var the share that it's sharing but not the actual file system. Because if we look at temp, hmm, we could check out that log.txt file and see what it's really sharing. We have that in Samba. A little bit of learning for me. Okay, anonymous puts it in home Kenobi share. And that's all. Oh, the mount, the mount is different. I was going the wrong thing. I was using the NFS, I was, connecting to the SMB share when I should have been connecting to the var that is an NFS share. Sorry, I got confused. Let's go ahead and make a directory that we can go ahead and copy this to. So let's make directory, um, let's just call it NFS, and they're going to use mount with the machine IP address, colon var, and that's going to understand, okay, this is an NFS share we're going to connect it to, and I'll put it in the NFS directory. So let's do that. Let's use mount, um, it's RIP for the box, var at to NFS, the directory that we just created. Looks like I need to be root, so let me sudo that. Takes a second because there's probably a lot to put in there. Okay, yep. So let's now move into that NFS directory that we just made and let's see what we have. Seemingly the file system. Okay, so because we put it in temp, now we have an IDRSA file in there. So that's going to actually be Kenobi's SSH key. Let's go ahead and copy that out. Up, up, up. And because that's all we needed, I'm actually going to sudo umount nfs so when i disconnect from the vpn it doesn't get all messy and make that folder hang every single time there we go let's say that we've done that 
and we need to now use that IDRSA key to SSH into the Kenobi user. So let me go ahead. I will uh, make that IDRSA permissions 600 with CH mod, so only I can read it, and it's a safe and secure SSH key that SSH will be willing to use. And I'll specify Kenobi at our IP address, uh, and I need to specify the dollar sign IP address because it will resolve the variable. Yes, I'm totally cool to connect to it. And there we go, we're in, we are logged in as Kenobi. So what do we have in here? We have our user.txt flag, which we need to go ahead and submit for that answer here. Oh, we hadn't been taking notes, my bad. <laughs> Who cares? Don't actually have that mentality. We gain initial access, why is that still wrong? Okay, we need to mark some of these things as completed. Sorry. Now we're moving on to the task four. Privilege escalation with path variable, path variable manipulation. Okay, so we're talking about some set UID binaries. Let's first understand what SUID, SGID, and sticky bits are. SUID bit allows the user that executing the file having the permission of the owner of the file. So if I executed something as Kenobi and that file were owned by root, if it were a set UID bit, I would still be operating everything that that binary or that program would do or that file would do as the root user. So that's awesome because that's potentially a privesc. SGID, sticky bit. SUID bits can be dangerous. Yep, potentially a privesc. Some binaries such as password, like the command password, need to be ran with elevated privileges as it's resetting your password on the system. However, other custom files that have this SUID bit can lead to all sorts of issues. To search the system for these files, run the following. Okay, so they give us a good find command to use here. Let's go ahead and run that. So this will look for the permissions that have a sticky, or a, sorry, that S representing a set UID bit and looking for files and all the standard errors being redirected to nowhere. So looking through this, there are a few of here that kind of look normal. And I guess the understanding and exposure of what looks normal is just kind of from experience, from just doing this a little bit more, or you could use your own host system as a baseline. So I'm connected to Kenobi down here on my bottom and I'll actually change the color here so you can see that that is the target and this down here is my host. If I ran that same command, we could see all the weird binaries on my system that are set UID. Um, I don't happen to have some of the ones that they have, but I see SU, I see ping, mount, the others, etc. U mount is in there. Sudo is in there. I don't see user bin menu. So user bin menu kind of sticks out to me as odd and strange and weird. Maybe that's something custom. So let's copy that and submit that as our answer for this guy. And that's correct. Now run the binary, how many options appear? Okay, so let's go ahead and run here. It says status check, kernel version, and IF config. So there are three options. And we could try some of these, status check. Okay, looks like it made an HTTP request. Interesting. What does the kernel version do? Okay, that tells us something from uNameTag A potentially. Oh, IF config is just going to run that command. Huh. So strings is a command on Linux that looks for human readable strings on a binary. So if I were to run strings on that user bin menu, we could look for some of the things that maybe that's doing. Looks like status check. Okay, that's actually going to run curl on our local host. Kernel version will run uname tech r and IF config will run potentially IF config. We don't know for sure because we aren't looking at the source code here. We're just looking at the strings in the binary. But because these are running commands without kind of a, a fixed path, like without the absolute path, it's just curl whatever happens to be in your path first. And it's running the set UID binary. And let me show you that. LS tech L. You can see it's RWS for that set UID. You can see it's kind of all in red and noted that, hey, this is owned by root. So set UID binary, this command will execute as the context of the root user. So we can abuse this because we know, okay, it's running curl and we could kind of create our own curl binary that's going to happen or be executed first because we can put that higher up in our path and make that executable. You can see TryHackMe includes a good picture for this. Let me show you that. Let's just copy bin sh or bin bash 
I'll do that and, and I'll make it a, a curl directory right in here or a curl, curl file. So I have dot slash curl, which is going to give me another bash shell. So I'll exit that and go back to my regular shell. But now that we've created this binary named curl and it's going to have the same name as what this program tries to run, if we modify our path to call that binary first, because it's executing as the permissions as root with the set UID binary, it should give us a root shell. So let's do that. We could check out our path variable and we could actually modify our path variable. If I say, let's export path to our current directory, right? Home Kenobi. Oh, it actually has been in there as a potential path. So we could, let's, let's use both. Let's say home Kenobi. Let's modify uh, that separate with a colon because that is a delimiter for path variable. And let's include the rest of the path variable inside of it there. So now that we've set that, we could go with an echo path and you can see my home directory, home Kenobi is just in there just as well. So if I run curl by default, now it's going to give me a bash shell rather than running the curl command because it's reaching that path first in the path expansion, path variable expansion. So now if I were to try and run our user bin menu, and if I were to go ahead and check our status, looks like we don't have curl localhost. Uh, that happened because it's executing that binary and not including tag P. Uh, that might be how it's done. They use a echo command, which is interesting to me because it might just be executing that simply um, as a script, potentially. I'm making a lot of flops in this video. Let's, re let's, let's change that up. Let's rm our curl and let's now make uh, echo bin bash. That's kind of just a simple file or a script. Cat curl, it's going to run bin bash. Now let's run our user bin menu and choose one. Now it didn't do that whatsoever. Kind of peculiar. Maybe we could use our sh. They put it in temp. Bin sh. Maybe sh will keep the permissions rather than bash. So let's just try it in our curl one more time. If I were to run curl. Oh, and you still need to mark it as executable. So that's probably why it didn't run earlier. Uh, if I were to curl, now I have a regular shell. If I were to run our menu, now I have the root shell. Um, does SH keep its permissions without specifying an argument? Because bash, I know you probably need the tack P. Let's try doing that with bash. Rather than using echo, or while using echo, rather than making a binary, let's just have it be kind of a file to execute that is a script, and then it will run bash tack P into curl. So now when I run curl, gives me a shell. If I go back to run my menu, if I run status check, now I'm root. Okay, so sh, excuse me, sh does not need to have that tack p argument to kind of maintain the permissions. Bash does. So now that I'm root, okay, let's go ahead into my root directory and I have a root flag in there so we can cat that out and call that box done. Okay. So real box, real video, real thing. Uh, obviously I made a couple mistakes in there, but hopefully those showcase some learnings, uh, not just for me, but also for you. And it, it's uh, cool and peculiar because while we, maybe we didn't need to even specify our own um, addition to the path because we saw when we checked out that path variable, we also already had home Kenobi bin and we could very well just create that directory. We could have made that not having to modify that path variable since it already has some of our own locally writable locations in there. So, okay. I'm losing some steam. I am uh, going to call this video done. I'm going to wrap this up and say, okay, cool. We completed Kenobi. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you liked this video. Uh, if you did, please do press that like button, do the YouTube algorithm things, leave a comment, say whatever you want, say whatever you want. <laughs> uh, subscribe would be great. I'd love to see you guys in the Discord server, Patreon, PayPal, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the stuff, all the internet things. All right, I'll see you guys later. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.